Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very uh, good morning uh, again, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this um, session uh, with the GLIC captains uh, entitled Business as Usual or Unusual. Well, we are truly privileged to have uh, three uh, gentlemen um, in their prime, so to speak. Uh, uh, they're all in their late 40s. Uh, and one of them is actually in the, his 50th. Um, now, we have uh, uh, Sharil, uh, Tunku Ali Zakri, and uh, Tuan uh, Said Hamada um, from um, Kazana, EPF, uh, and Co-op, uh, respectively. Um, and between the three gentlemen, um, they manage some 1.2 trillion ringgit um, of funds. Uh, that's a lot of money uh, by any measure. Uh, we're only missing one other guy um, um, at PMB uh, who's managing uh, 300 million, 300 billion ringgit rather. Um, so uh, Zul Karnain is only in his first first week um, on the job. So um, we are giving him a break, so to speak. Uh, but notwithstanding that, um, I think uh, 1.2 trillion is a significant amount. Now, um, there's the theme of um, this investment measure 2020 um, is um, recover, advance, and sustain. Um, now, indeed, uh, we all know about the challenges of um, COVID-19 and the uh, efforts towards recovery. Um, let me perhaps start with uh, the question to our uh, panelists here. Uh, how tough has it been uh, for them uh, in the first half of 2020, and how do they see the rest of 2020? and 2021. Now, uh, I'm told there's a certain packing order uh, among the GLICs. Um, so we normally start with uh, the most senior, uh, not necessarily in terms of age, uh, but uh, in terms of exposure, having been uh, in two GLICs before. So, Dr. Sharil, you go first. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tanshri. I think um, quite clearly, as an investor, um, our uh, uh, experience with COVID and what's happened really for the first half of this year um, basically has varied in terms of where those investments are. Um, so while we've seen a lot of gains, uh, both from a value point of view and an operational point of view in our technology and communications related exposures, um, we also expose uh, due to our strategic presence in aviation and in travel and tourism uh, to sectors which have been particularly badly hit. Um, so that I think is a reflection I think of uh, the reality of the economy today. And what you're going to see basically is both growth and recovery um, being, I think, uh, out of step, depending on which sector you're in. Uh, we believe basically that aviation and tourism um, are in particularly difficult situations, as you can imagine, uh, with the amount of restrictions that's going on. Um, and certainly, I think the path of recovery for those industries uh, will be very long and difficult, um, and we are geared up for that. Um, but again, like I said, being a well-diversified fund, uh, we have exposure also to areas which have actually done very well out of uh, basically what's happening here, um, both in healthcare, uh, both in technologies, uh, communications. I think those are sectors which will continue to perform um, under the circumstances. Um, other areas, obviously, I think a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think we are watching with some caution uh, the banking sector um, and the financial sector to look at what stresses there are in the system, uh, especially since a lot of um, items are probably not so visible at this point in time, uh, given the moratoriums that are going on, as well as the reliefs that's going on. Um, so that's an area that um, probably you know, a lot of investors are watching um, uh, very, very carefully. Uh, but I think basically you know, the, the, the whole point of investing is to be diversified, uh, both from a risk point of view um, and from a growth point of view. And that approach, I think, will serve as well, as it will serve, I think, other funds. Thank you. Okay, so Tanshri, uh, as the second person with the least amount of scar, oh, well, second most amount of scars after Sharil. Um, the first quarter was quite challenging, of course, for, for EPF. Uh, I, we've just released our first quarter results, and of course, we took quite a hit in terms of our, um, from the assets of the equity side. But I think the one advantage of being an EPF is because we are a long-term fund, right? So rather than look at the COVID like, uh, you know, the, the enemy who's out there, uh, like the Klingon out there who take over the, you know, the civilization, we can also look at it in terms from an opportunistic perspective. Because especially in mid-March, when the equities, uh, well, nearly everywhere, equities just went down, this, which was actually a great uh, timing for us to actually start going in to also pick up fundamentally strong stocks, right? 
So again, as I mentioned, uh, EPF being a long-term fund and the COVID being what I, I would call it the great revealer because it really actually showed the type of assets, the type of companies and the type of businesses that will not last in the long term. Right? So if, 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 if I were to compare to my compatriots here, because their time horizons are very different from mine, I want to go and see, I want to be involved in sectors and, and, and companies that will be around in the next 10, 20 years. And with COVID, it actually showed uh, whether those companies which doesn't have very strong governance uh, practices, uh, strong pivotability capabilities, uh, they won't survive. And they won't survive. So for us, uh, moving forward, when you talk about uh, what, what do we see, we take it very positively because, you know, in every crisis, there's always opportunity. And I think we've managed to go and pick up the, 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 the nice uh, stocks, which we actually serve our members uh, very well. So um, we've still got two more quarters to go. So, you know, we can uh, hope for the best and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see much better performance towards the end of the year. Inshallah, looking forward to that. Um, Tuan Said Hamada. Okay, thank you, Tan Sri. Uh, like other institutional investors, it has been a tough right, you know, a road tough and a roller coaster ride like, for the first half of 2020. Uh, as you recall, for, with a low of 1,207 on 19th of March, just after the PKP, to a high of 1,590 somewhere in, on the 9th of June. But again, you know, um, like, uh, like APF, we are also a long-term investor. Um, in order to understand this, we must understand the, you know, the liability, the nature of a liability of a pension fund. Yeah? One is their long-term. For example, currently we have about two-thirds of our members are still working and not drawing pension. Another one-third is drawing the current pension. Uh, we also have, a, I mean, another, another nature of our liability is like a real, we are, you know, it's, it's inflation link kind of liability. So um, it's long-term and inflation link. And the last one is probably the large part of our liability is actually almost 100% of our liability is in Ringgit Malaysia. No, if you like. So with that, you know, we remain focused to invest in the domestic market. The domestic market, even if we go to you know to diversify uh, to go overseas, is purely for the benefit of diversification and to to, to achieve an optimum risk matrix, uh, risk return. Uh, why call it a reward? Um, uh, we, as I said, you know, as a long-term investor, uh, we we take this. COVID-19 PKP uh, setback uh, as an opportunity. Uh, for example, we created a mandate, you know, a COVID-19 mandate, a specific COVID-19 mandate within our internal portfolio in order for, the, for, the, you know, for our traders to actually uh, take advantage and pick up all the, all the good stocks, you know, long-term stock, good value stocks, high dividend stocks in order for, for us to actually look into the future to get most, uh, most of the benefit into the, uh, that, uh, that we can benefit from all these stocks in the, in, in the future. So we are not, uh, yes, we are affected short term, but we are not too worried because we are a long-term investor. Uh, I think that is from, the, from, our, from my point of view. Well, thank you. I can appreciate that, uh, focusing on the fundamentals. Yeah. So indeed, uh, whilst there are some concerns about uh, certain industries, um, I think that Shari mentioned about um, the financial services, but I think uh, there's enough resilience um, in the various companies that we have in. Uh, again, just as um, a point of interest, uh, I know some people spoke about uh, the earnings uh, being uh, approaching 20 times PE and so on. Um, but uh, I think um, at the same time, there's also that underlying uh, buffer, uh, so to speak, in terms of the uh, net asset value uh, cover. Uh, so uh, the last check, uh, I think we noticed that some 71% of the stocks uh, listed on Bursa Malaysia are trading at a discount to net asset value. Uh, and 67% of them are actually trading at a discount to net tangible assets. Um, so I think that provides some downside, uh, if I may. Now, um, if I uh, can just um, you know, uh, touch upon some of the things um, the uh, Minister of Finance uh, had said um, in his uh, keynote address earlier. Uh, so we've heard uh, from him this morning uh, that uh, the government uh, has already spent uh, some, or rather is spending some 45 billion ringgit uh, through... Uh, various measures uh, under the Prihatin um, uh, stimulus uh, package um, and uh, the Penjana uh, recovery package. Um, and that will stretch uh, the government uh, finances to a deficit of uh, between 5.8% to uh, 6% for uh, 2020. Uh, and he also articulated um, the theme for budget 2021, uh, 
um, comprising of four elements, uh, caring for the people, uh, steering uh, the uh, economy, uh, improving uh, sustainable living, and enhancing a public service delivery system. Um, so, um, any thoughts um, on what more the government uh, could do uh, to help accelerate uh, the economic recovery? Uh, let me perhaps start from the other side. Uh, <laughs> one side. Okay, um, during the PKP season, the COVID-19 season, co uh, you know, together with the Ministry of Finance, uh, we work together in terms of you know, uh, working out a few things. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, you know, meeting some of the pension obligation, things like that. You know? So we have done quite well in terms of that. But what more can the government do? Uh, apart from, I mean, as, as an organisation, we also contributed to the, to the, to the frontliners, uh, uh, also, we invested in, in, in you know, in uh, assisting our police Diraja Malaysia with the drone technology because we invested in one of the companies uh, which provides you know, uh, uh, services eh, using drone technology. Uh, but what more can uh, the government do? I think uh, I think we have to focus on uh, you know promoting domestic tourism a bit more, um, uh, providing employment. And in terms of providing employment opportunity, uh, we Coab, I think the other glitch as well. We have actually uh, okay, launched you know, a, a program like SC just mentioned just now, you know, uh, employability program, the training, uh, training the unemployed graduates, etc. So this is uh, all that, uh, that, that, that at the organisation level that we have actually uh, took to our own initiative. Um, but uh, one thing is perhaps you know out of this COVID nineteen. Uh, is to invest more in terms of education uh, as well as to invest uh, more in terms of uh, food security. I think that is the two areas that I, I, would, thought that, uh, I would have thought that would be uh, beneficial for over the long term. Uh, one is in the education, we want to create a good ecosystem, uh, provide uh, constant supply of high, uh, uh, I call it, uh, uh, very competitive, very comp uh, highly educated uh, graduates, and also on the food uh, security, I think we have to rely uh, to you know to, to to start relying less and less from uh, on our on, on imports, and that would help our uh, our current exchange things like that stabilize our current exchange. That's it. Uh, thank you, um, said, uh, Tinku. Well, I'm going to go and wax lyrical on my favorite topic, which is social security agenda. Uh, I think one of the things which you actually saw from COVID, the countries that actually recovered very, very quickly, and I would actually say Malaysia was one of it, are the countries which actually has the social security infrastructure in place. Right? So for Malaysia, we actually have universal healthcare. Because we have universal healthcare, we were able to go and provide free testing to the Malaysians as well as to migrant workers as well as refugees for free. Right? And what, that was one of the reasons why in terms of our contact tracing and all that, we were very, very successful. And we're able to come out of this, 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 this curve much faster. You can look at some of those other countries. I'm not going to name them. I mean, they're the usual suspects. Very, very rich, but social security, not quite there. So the reason why I'm saying social security is because last week, there was the presentation made to the EAC. And because of COVID, you could see the EAC understood that social security is not a nice to have. It's not a, a, a charity. It's actually a fundamental infrastructure for a country to ensure we can get out of crises very, very quickly. And this is where uh, I was very stoked to actually see the EAC being led by the Prime Minister. He said that he's going to, 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 to push through the Malaysian social protection uh, agenda. And to me, I think this is a long time in coming. And for him to actually have mentioned that, and he said that he's going to take personal uh, ownership over it, that, that is very, very positive for me. So I think, uh, you know, making lemonade out of this lemon. Second thing that I want to push for, and I'm putting on my strategic hat uh, that we discussed yesterday, is that, I mean, we can see the economic bubbles now starting to come out, right? Uh, globally uh, speaking, where countries who are successful are starting to band together. So even in Southeast, Southeast Asia, uh, again, Malaysia is one of those countries that is, was one of the better countries in Southeast Asia that has actually positioned itself for the future. Taking that into account, I think we should actually take that opportunity to position ourselves to global corporations. 
those who are now going into uh, breaking up rather than the focusing area. You know, like last time they used to say, put all your manufacturing capabilities into China and they'll be able to serve the world. But COVID clearly uh, showed the weakness of that. And you can see the economic development is now, you need to go and have hub and spokes throughout. And I think Malaysia, if we, if we position ourselves correctly, if we message ourselves correctly, and you know, we, it's, it's not PR because it's real. I think we can actually take advantage for us to be a key hub player in Southeast Asia. So I think those are the two things uh, uh, from, from my end. Well, well thank you, uh, Tinku. Uh, I think it's very heartening to see that you, you remain committed uh, and passionate about uh, the uh, social yeah. uh, safety net Absolutely. Um, you know, for the benefit of um, our audience. Uh, so Tinku has always been engaging uh, previously the EPU and the government uh, about uh, doing better in this area. So Absolutely. happy with that. Dr. Cheryl. Yeah, I, I think some of the themes that we think about today, right, um, in the wake of the COVID experience, um, revolve around essentially the ideas of resilience in an economy. Um, and while, you know, my colleagues have talked about some of those aspects, I think it's quite clear that for an economy that needs to think about the future, you need to actually build this resilience um, structurally. Mm -hmm. In the same way that funds like ourselves always think about diversification and risk management as part of the resilience of the fund. Um, for a country as well, I think, you know, it's not just about a social safety net, it's about thinking about essentially the digital technologies that you need to put in place. Um, and that's why I said I think what's been an eye-opener, I think, for a lot of businesses and people, uh, essentially, is that leap into the digital technology and the digital lifestyle, basically, I think, is now inevitable. Um, and we've seen a huge uptake, basically, of bandwidth. Bandwidth requirements have gone up. Uh, we've seen, basically, the adoption um, through our e-payment platforms and everything else, right? A huge uptake on that, e-shopping, um, the whole works. And I think that's essentially irreversible now. Now, that, of course, has an impact and bearing on traditional businesses. Right? So if you think about traditional landlords or retail, you know, there's going to be an impact. Uh, but the resonance of the economy, I think, needs to be looked at and built on. Right? Um, you, what you don't want happening, basically, is that when future crisis comes, and the crisis comes from any different angle, a pandemic, a financial shock, um, you don't have your solutions being basically relying on that one X-wing fighter trying to take out the empire's dust on its own. Right? You actually want to have to build a fleet of resources, um, uh, which allows you to be resilient across various types of scenarios. And I think that's really the focus of any government, right? How do you build both the social resilience um, through a social safety net, which is highly critical, a public health system, um, education systems, which basically will serve as well in terms of um, any future growth areas as well. Um, and on the financial part, of course, making sure through our regulators and our participants, right, a stable financial system. Uh, so that's, that to me is the role of the government. Less so, I think, away from the old days when uh, you just think about um, governments just looking at promoting projects or investing in projects, uh, but actually thinking now about the structural resilience um, of the economy. And so on. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate all the input. Now, we, we've spoken about recovery. Uh, the next will be about how we advance forward. Now, uh, speaking about advancement, uh, I think um, we will not do justice if we don't talk about uh, the performance of the PLCs. Uh, so I think in my uh, welcoming address, I did mention about um, some of the successes we had in the past with the GLC transformation uh, program, uh, where we had these 17 government-linked companies uh, that went through uh, the uh, trans transformation program uh, that enabled them to uh, perform better uh, in terms of financial performance, in terms of governance, and played a great role uh, in nation building. Um, so. Uh, we've seen how their profits grew by 10.2% uh, per annum uh, and they generated uh, total shareholder returns of 11.1% uh, uh, per annum by the time they graduated, they graduated uh, in 2015. Um, I think the question is that um, how can we, um, uh, I suppose, uh, learn from some of the things we've done in the past, uh, having uh, done the recovery, how do we move forward and drive better performance not just from the government companies, uh, but uh, from all the public uh, listed companies uh, that we have here in Malaysia. Uh, so obviously, as, uh, major, <laughs> as major investors in the market, um, surely you have uh, a role to play. Absolutely. So maybe, uh, Tunku. Okay, uh, absolutely. Uh, no, you, you're absolutely right that the, the, the last gov uh, transformation program was very successful. And we can already start seeing uh, champions arising from it, uh, like the Maybanks of the world and all that. But now is the time, kita dah jadi jago kampung, you know, so we are now the village champion. So it's about time for us now to become the global champions. 
And I think that's the key question that we ask uh, our investing companies. Are you strong enough? Are you visionary enough? Are you um, flexible and adaptable enough to be able to go and take on the challenges out there? Now, we had the discussion yesterday about uh, you know, the, mis uh, the, the, the term, the government-linked companies, right? Um, and this was raised by Datuk Sharil, actually, so that I don't get into trouble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it has its, both its strengths and, and, and also its challenges. Because uh, the strength is, whatever you do, you know you have the, the, the backing of the government to make sure that you will achieve the agenda of the country, right? But is that enough when you actually start uh, stepping beyond the shores of the country? So the mindset, if you have this uh, government, if you have the wrong mindset of being a government company, is that, well, you know what, whatever I do, I'm, I'm never going to go wrong. So why take chances? Why take risks? So uh, I, I will be protected anyway. That is the negative aspect of thinking from a government. Uh, and I hope majority of our companies don't think that way. So they're already saying, OK, you know what? I've been given enough time to the, the papa. Eh? So uh, my hand has been held. But now it's time to be kicked out of the nest. And let's see whether those companies actually can fly. And we've seen, you know, like, like the Maybank. It's now becoming a regional champion uh, uh, all across uh, Southeast Asia as well as in Asia, Asia Pacific. We've got some um, uh, global champions like Air Asia also. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the rise of, of Air Asia in, in, in becoming a very strong brand name. So Malaysians and Malaysian companies can do it. And I think now uh, we should start moving beyond this um, definition of GLCs and just being called Corporate Malaysia and being called world champions. I think that's, that's the, 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 the challenge uh, moving forward. That's a very interesting approach. Dr. Cheryl. Yeah, I think um, you know, you, you've heard me talk about this before. right? I've, I've never really been very fond of the idea or the term GLCs. Right? Um, I think you know, we have to be very careful about what we term as a GLC because actually most of what we invest in as funds actually are perfectly mm. normal corporations which should behave like normal corporations and focus on shareholder returns. Right? Uh, and that's hugely important. I think if you look, you know, alluding to what you said earlier, I think if you look at Malaysia's corporate earnings over the last few years, has been honestly quite disappointing as a whole. Uh, it's actually been declining. Um, and that's, I think, due to, I think, a lack of focus really on what's really important to shareholders. So we need to, I think, separate out some of the political messaging, the national mes messaging away from what's really vital for a capital market to perform and for shareholders to get their returns. And that's really about what's really good for shareholders and for basically the workers of the company, um, as opposed to unnecessarily confusing that uh, with other messages. Um, and I know I've spoken about the golden share and why I don't think golden shares are actually strictly necessary anymore. Uh, so I'm not going to get into trouble again on that. Uh, but just talking about essentially where we are with uh, corporate Malaysia, yeah. I think basically that it's actually incumbent on the shareholders to work together. And you know, we've been, Kazan has been working very closely with other clicks. Uh, to address the boards of these companies uh, to really force home the issue of um, shareholder returns. Right? Um, there's a reason why a lot of companies really are trading below NTA or NAV. It's basically because their ROEs don't support the valuation. Right? That's, that's the core of it uh, at the end of the day. So we need to drive returns. We need to drive basically profitability. And if that making, means making some hard decisions about either your strategy or your operations, then we should do so. Right? Um, if that's really what is important to shareholders, then let's f focus on that and fix it. So again, uh, broadening the subject matter beyond GLCs, talking about the PLCs in general. Um, so uh, between the three of you uh, plus PMB, um, you, know, you probably uh, have the largest uh, shareholding uh, in many corporates um, beyond the GLCs. Uh, now, uh, I guess, um, would you be prepared uh, to use your voting power to vote out board members um, or management of uh, underperforming companies. Absolutely. And, and EPF, um, you know, we've, we've proven it in the past. We are not happy with the way that a uh, company is being run, uh, you know, where if the management or the board doesn't take into account our input points, we are prepared to walk. Right. And, and we've proven that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so rather than just selling off the stocks, vote, um, vote the non-performing board yes. and management out. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I mean, uh, we have a very strict uh, corporate governance uh, code of principles which we've actually issued since 2010, you know, and, and we've been uh, evolving that. And uh, now we are starting moving away from a much more, uh, uh, you know, making it as a punishment, so they, uh, don't go there, 
to we are becoming much more towards this is where you should move towards. So uh, investee companies will see more and more direction from us in the areas that we want them to focus on, specifically in the ESG, uh, the ESG areas specifically, because we, we think that ESG is always the best barometer for a company that's well run. If you do your ESG very well, the company is most likely uh, bound to succeed. So for those investee companies, make sure your ESG is in place before EPF comes knocking at your door. Thank you. Tansai. Yes, likewise, you know, we will continue to engage with our investee companies and press, stress on the importance of ESG because we believe that ESG can, uh, can deliver sustainable benefits to our shareholders uh, or to our stakeholders and also to enhance our return over the long term. Lah. So shareholder activism is another thing that we actually continue in, uh, engaging with our uh, uh, investee companies uh, to understand their business, their challenges, etc. In terms of voting, uh, we will stick at the moment with our voting guidelines and voting policies that we have actually uh, uh, instituted uh, within our organization. Um, so if, we need, if it needs to be that we will vote against, or you know, if it doesn't meet the parameter, we will vote against. But uh, otherwise, we will, we will just stick to our parameters and policies. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a stand that we, we take currently. Thank you for the thoughts. Um, well, Tunku, earlier on you mentioned about um, uh, growing more uh, champions, original champions. Uh, again, beyond the GLCs, so I think uh, we should be looking at the, all the PLCs overall. Uh, help them to uh, grow uh, into the region and, and global too. So indeed, um, so you mentioned about Asia being the global champion. So of course now our global uh, manufacturers uh, are global champions. And I think YB uh, Minister mentioned about the press metal uh, and, and so on. Um, I just want to maybe just uh, maybe one uh, point to make is that uh, whilst we do encourage um, nation corporates to go abroad um, and become regional champions, it is very important uh, for everyone to recognize the fact that you can never be a regional or global champion if your home base is weak. And that's something which I learned very, very expensively uh, when I was at uh, Telecom Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, so I just uh, I thought I'd share that uh, with you. Now, um, okay, we've spoken about um, recovery, uh, advancement, and uh, moving forward, uh, sustain. Uh, so you touched a bit on um, ESG. Um, so indeed, um, uh, as we move forward, um, uh, the three themes of uh, corporate governance, sustainability, uh, and profitability are all needed uh, for companies to maintain uh, healthy earnings and thereby uh, enabling a strong market. Uh, when it comes to ESG, um, where are all of you, uh, Coop, EPF, and Kazana, uh, in terms of uh, process and progress uh, in ESG? Yeah, I'll start there. I think at Kazana, uh, we've started to incorporate ESG requirements um, into our investment philosophy and criteria um, and using it as a filter really to think about what we want to invest in uh, for the long term. Um, and I think it's important. I think basically there is a new demand really, uh, not just among the people that we serve, the people of Malaysia, uh, but even among our own employees right, who really take a passion about the subject itself. Mm. Uh, on the other side as well, we're also working with a lot of the companies we already have investments in um, to help them think through ESG. Um, and this is particularly important, especially in um, you know, companies which are involved in energy, for instance, right? uh, where these are much more pressing concerns. Um, so uh, I think it's two ways. Uh, one, basically, our own internal criteria. And secondly, of course, um, assisting companies to understand their own requirements and their own obligations. Um, so I think we are quite active now. Uh, on that front. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, from EPF's uh, perspective, uh, you know, we're moving away from this very logic, structured, Spock-like thinking, thinking, you know, of, of looking at companies, of just looking at your balance sheets and your P&Ls, uh, because we believe that ESG has a distinct multiplier imp uh, impact in terms of uh, profitability. I mean, we just had a look uh, from during the COVID crisis, actually. Um, from our portfolio of uh, investments, um, out of our top social uh, stocks, it actually only went down less than 10% compared to the KLCI, which went down more than 16%. You know? So ESG stocks actually has a resilience at the end of the day. It's not, again, as I mentioned, you know, it's not nice to have. It's a definite need to have. Um, we also look in terms of like some companies out there which actually embrace that social aspect of their business. 
and actually made it into a real business. So for example, uh, overseas, there's this company called Bayersdorf, which does ne uh, Nivea cream. So Nivea cream was uh, for the longest of time like coming down you know, in terms of their, their, their profitability. But when COVID came into play, they pivoted very, very quickly and said they're going to go into, um, what was it, um, uh, disinfectant products using their base creams. And within the space, a very short space, their stock recovered by more than 15%. Uh, so to, to me, I think ESG is not, uh, again, it's, it's not a charity. It's definitely a need to have. And if you actually go into it very aggressively and you really push it through, which we can because we are the money, and you know things go where the money is. Um, and if the companies pivot properly, I think we'll be able to go and balance both sustainability as well as profitability in a very, very nice way. Thank you, Tunku. That's it. I see. Uh, Co-op started its journey on, on ESG, um, I think way back in 2014, 2015. Eh? And, and I, I'm proud to say that Co-op is one of the first uh, pension fund signatory to the PRI lah, uh, back in 2018 and followed by EPF and Kazana, I think, after that. So it, to list out all the ESG initiatives, I think uh, it will take a bit of time. Lah. I have it you know, in front of me. Eh? So, but we, for example, we have a uh, ESG mandate that we actually uh, outsource to our external fund managers. Um, like Kazana, we also have uh, ESG uh, principles uh, embedded into all of our investment proposals. Huh? And um, in terms of our investment itself, a direct investment, we have also invested a lot in, in renewable energy, in, in LEED buildings, you know. For example, we, we, we are, you know, we are one, you know, one of our investing companies in the UK, uh, one of the largest solar, farm, uh, solar power producer in the UK, and we are currently working with our technology partner to actually uh, expand our, our renewable energy platform into, to include wind farm as well. So that is work in progress. So what we plan is that you know, once we have gathered an, uh, you know, sufficient experience overseas uh, with our technology partner, then we would like to bring that technology back into Malaysia and to actually expand our renewable energy uh, portfolio uh, in not just in Malaysia but also in Southeast Asia. So, I mean, the list goes on. Um, uh, we have uh, ESG guidelines, etc. And I think ESG is very much embedded into co-op investment philosophy and it will continue to, to be that way for a foreseeable future. Thank you, Tuan Said. Uh, yeah. One thing we've learned uh, from the money analysis is that um, ESG companies, um, uh, they tend to have lower uh, cost of capital, yes. uh, boost uh, cost of equity and cost of debt. And uh, that, uh, when you invert it, uh, works out to better valuation. So, so I guess uh, maybe, uh, are there any specific investments that you've made that you are particularly proud of in this space uh, that can inspire uh, everyone else here? Uh, well, from, from our end, something which was very interesting. We were having an over, overlook in terms of our, the performance of our external fund managers. And of our entire fund managers during that time period of COVID specifically, they were all in the negative territory, mm -hmm. except for one. And that one was actually an ESG fund. And that was the one which really sparked my, 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 my interest because I was like saying, previously it always used to be a gut feel, you know? We sort of like feel we do right, we do good. At the end of the day, it could translate into doing, doing well. But now I have it in black and white from a financial perspective that a, a fund manager that we employ, which was fully into ESG, they were the ones who actually made money. During, during the COVID crisis. So I've actually um, uh, asked my team to go and do a, a much more in-depth research into our own uh, investments and to go and put our hypothesis to test, you know, that this is the, definitely the right way to go. So I suppose this is one good news that I can actually put on the table. It's no longer academic. It's, it's actually starting to show real returns. Brilliant, thank you. Mr. Cheryl? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, Kazana has always been at the forefront of this um, and Kazana was one of the first issuers of a, um, you know, ESG bond. Uh, this was what we used to essentially fund our education initiatives. Um, and I think, you know, when you talk about ESG, it's not just about investing in shares. Also, I think other capital structures and instruments that you can utilize, I think, to forward the causes that you want to do, right? Uh, so that's been quite innovative. Um, you know, Kazana has also been basically the, one of the key sponsors of the Taman Tugu project here mm. in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, which is really a huge initiative to you know ensure the 
visibility and viability of green spaces right, um, in our city. Uh, huge success as well, uh, and something which you know, we are now planning to basically to endow permanently uh, into a national trust um, and waiting for the government to enact the land transfer, um, which will be fantastic. It will be a gift from the government basically to the people of Malaysia right, uh, in perpetuity. Um, so there's a lot of things we've been doing. Um, don't want to go into too much details of it, but I think you know, it's, I just want to highlight basically that you don't have to just do the investments part. You can actually do other capital structures, you can do other more interesting things right, uh, to promote some of these uh, better ESG causes as well. I'm glad you mentioned Taman Tegu uh, project. I think that's a great uh, project. Absolutely. And I know it, it was um, criticized earlier for its costing of 600 million uh, ringgit and so oh, on. No, I, I, but I think, yeah. That costs. <laughs> but um, yeah, so of course it will be cut. And I think certainly if you do something uh, based on real cause and purpose, I think inshallah uh, yeah. it will turn out right. No, but Tansri, you know, you want to talk about ESG. It's not all a bit of roses. Because, I mean, the, the promise is there, the dream is there, but in the implementation, at the end of the day, there's two snacks from an EPF perspective. Number one is in terms of reportability, right? Because not a lot of companies out there actually uh, capture the impact or the, the outcome of, of, of the ESG practices, uh, which can then be put into our annual reports, right? Because how do you translate the, 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 the enjoyment of going to Tugu into something... Uh, which we can then report to our shareholders, for example, right? That's, that's one challenge that we face. The second challenge that we face, specifically from an EPF perspective, is also in terms of um, whether it actually makes sense for our members. Because at the end of the, the day, my care on the ground, you know, who cares, you know, if we do good and we, we provide green air or whatever? I still need to go and send my kids to school. I still need to go and put uh, food on the table. So their challenge to EPF specifically is I want my dividends. So for us moving forward, from an ESG perspective, it's great, but how do I then translate it into something that makes sense to my members? And how do I then also translate it into something that I can report into something tangible in my annual report? Oh, thank you, Tiku. Uh, not just check here, but I also rely on dividends from EPF. <laughs> uh, so keep them coming and growing. Uh, I'll give you social dividends. Uh, okay, uh, that will count too. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tansai, any... Um, examples, uh, success stories uh, in ESG investments. In you ESG. mentioned about the um, uh, solar and so on. Yeah, I think I've mentioned yeah. a bit of a bit of them. Sensory, yeah? So I don't have any other examples as well. Great. Now, um, if you talk about ESG, uh, I, I don't think you can run away from uh, speaking about stewardship. Uh, now, in your experience, how effective uh, is stewardship in driving the adoption of sustainable principles? Uh, among corporates and other, are there any particular sectors or industries that stand to gain competitive advantage with the uh, incorporation of sustainability principles uh, in their business uh, operations? Yeah, I, I think it's something which you know, I personally have been working on for a while. Even when I was you know, hitting the EPF, right, uh, we started our initiatives around stewardship and sustainability. And, and in the Malaysian context particularly, it's always been challenging for, in fact, our palm oil industry. Right? And how do we meet the challenges of the consumer demands uh, in our key markets. Um, and we have to tackle this um, head on. So we've always been encouraging a, a really meaningful dialogue uh, with our investment companies around the issue of sustainability, around the issues of, I think, stewardship of the earth in particular, which is their responsibility. Right? Um, and us as shareholders, key shareholders, uh, basically performing our roles as stewards um, of the shareholder interest right? for its long-term sustainability and long-term growth uh, for the companies that we're involved in. Um, but it is a journey, um, and quite honestly, I think some companies are much better equipped. I think like Zaki was mentioning, right? Uh, what we've seen basically is that those companies which grasp the principles quickly are able to actually maintain or protect their market share or even grow it uh, better than others. In fact, I want to go and uh, take from the point of uh, plantations, because plantations has always been the demon of, of, of ESG, right? Uh, but, but this is where we need to go and uh, redo the sins of our fathers, you know, uh, in terms of the plantations and the deforestations. If we have this very negative mindset saying that, you know, plantations is always the worst in terms of our ESG, I don't think that is true. Because nowadays, Malaysian plantations especially is leading in terms of sustainability practices from, from, uh, with palm oil, right? And if we were able to go and do traceability uh, programs and we can uh, make sure that it is actually certified, there is a market out there globally that would pay for uh, certified sustainable palm oil products because whether we like it or not, palm oil is one of the most productive uh, trees in the world, right? Uh, from a per hectare basis, it's the most productive. 
So if we were to actually translate our total practices into ESG, you can actually go into the, uh, the margin play now. So currently, when we look into palm oil, we're always like a commodity, right? So it's in terms of uh, volume, volume, volume. So rather than just go into the volume game, put that layer of ESG, and all of a sudden, you can charge a margin for sustainable palm oil products, which is in nearly everything that we use for. So again, I want to go and insist that sustainability and ESG has real economic value. If we think creatively enough, if we are willing to actually uh, be bold and uh, explore and take this voyage you know, into, into the future. So thank you to, for bringing up the uh, RSPO uh, issue. Yes. So wearing my WW, uh, <laughs> trusty hat um, uh, of uh, WWF Malaysia, uh, so I think, uh, yes, we would like to encourage all plantation companies not just to go for MSPO, yes. but uh, after that to actually upgrade to RSPO as well. Uh, so that's an encouragement for all the Malaysian plantation companies. One side. Yeah, early this year, we started measuring the investment carbon footprint of co equity portfolio. Uh, and so we are going to build up data and continue to measure this and will actually uh, to identify the carbon emissions generated based on the existing co as domestic equity portfolio and measures can be taken to mitigate climate change risks you know, uh, going forward. Okay, so this is something then which uh, our, our investment guys, our research guys uh, have uh, been working and uh, as I said just now, earlier this year, we started measuring this. And hopefully, we can get something of this to change the, you know, the world. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, um, we spent 40, about 40, 45 minutes already. And I think that um, it's time uh, to uh, open the question to uh, the other participants. Uh, so we have uh, probably about 15 minutes or so. Um, I'm just looking at my uh, Slido here um, to look at some questions. Um, okay, there's uh, one question um, from Anonymous. Uh, uh, foreigners stay net sellers in Malaysia equity market uh, for years. Uh, what can we do uh, to attract their interest? So indeed, uh, for the first six months of this year, we've seen some 3.8 billion US dollars of uh, net uh, outflow by foreign uh, investors. Um, any thoughts on how we can actually bring them back uh, to the market? Uh, well, you know what? I, the flight is just a natural herd instinct, right? Flight to safety. But moving forward, again, you know, uh, based on the points that had actually raised, uh, out of this COVID crisis, Malaysia has actually shown resilience in terms of dealing with crisis. And uh, if, in fact, now I'm putting myself on the other shoe, right? Um, when I now look at any country or any business, I look at the capability of being able to handle um, shocks because for us, we believe that COVID is just the beginning of many, you know, because shocks is going to become the norm moving forward. So with that thinking in place, we need to go and then test any economy whether they are able to handle such shocks. And this COVID being the great revealer actually shows the type of economies that we're not able to go and handle. In fact, you know, they are going into a downward spiral. Whereas Malaysia, on the other hand, you know, small economy, bukanya, so, so gagasi or whatever, but we were able to go and pivot very, very quickly, very, very effectively, with very minimal social impact, and also stability was there, you know, uh, opening up of the economy and so on and so forth. So uh, for, for me, I think we should shout about that more. And again, uh, like what I had also mentioned earlier on, take advantage of the new world order that has been created with the bubbles being created and position ourselves as the champion of that bubble and in, in specific areas. So for example, like maybe distribution and logistics for Southeast Asia. Malaysia is literally the center of Southeast Asia, right? So I think it's just a matter of putting all of this together. We've got a lot of strengths, but let's do a proper marketing uh, program now for us to really put it out there. Thank you. I, I agree with uh, Ali Zakri. I think we should take advantage of all uh, of, the, you know, of the fortunate situation that we have arising from the COVID-19. We are the first, among the first uh, uh, country to actually recover from, uh, from COVID-19, you know, successful in flattening the curve. Uh, our healthcare system is of world class, you know, uh, and it's accessible to everyone. So I think these are the, the points you know, which, which we can sell to our uh, 
foreign investors eh, to, to come and establish their presence in Malaysia for the reasons that I just mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, we have to understand. I think market participants tend to be rational in their own mind about why they put money in or why they take money out. Right? And alluding to what I said earlier about corporate earnings, right? it's really no surprise why the market's not been that attractive um, because it's not been a market where you could have seen much growth as a whole in terms of basically your earnings and your valuations. Right? So if we can fix that, I think then, then you know, chances are much better uh, that investors will stop treating um, you know, the, the Malaysian market like you know, an ice planet hoff or something, right? And actually come back and put their money back into um, the market here. Um, so, so that's back to the fundamentals, really back to, I think, corporate earnings, back to basically making sure we develop resilient companies which are ESG compliant, focus on shareholder returns. Um, and I think that money will naturally flow back. Mm. Uh, indeed, I mean, I do subscribe to that. I think at the end of the day, if you focus on doing the right things, uh, I think uh, God willing, inshallah, um, they'll come back. Uh, after all, investors are there to actually generate returns for their uh, unit holders and for, your, for their stakeholders. Now, um, there's one comment here. Um, you know, I, I guess thanking uh, Kazana uh, for that Tamantugu project. Uh, goodwill towards Kazana, uh, the gentleman, uh, uh, sorry, the, the lady said. Um, I've got one question here from uh, someone uh, by the name of Abbas. Um, now, talking about sustainability, uh, it's also uh, means ensuring uh, talent rejuvenation and growth. Uh, can you share uh, your initiatives on this front? Talent uh, development and talent rejuvenation. Yeah, I, I think um, if you look at the pipeline of talent in Malaysia, um, we have very talented people coming through the ranks. Um, uh, it's actually incumbent on companies, um, employers, and ultimately shareholders to create those opportunities for them to actually show uh, those talents. Um, and certainly, I think from a professionalism point of view, I think, you know, uh, at least in the space where, you know, I operate professionally, which is basically in fund management, investment, financial services, I don't think there's a shortage of, of real Malaysian talent, um, really, to, to manage basically investments and financial services sector. Um, I think, you know, you need to what my colleagues have said, I think where we are seeing probably a shortage, you know, honestly, is more in areas where we're going to see further growth in the future, right? When I talk about AI, digital, um, and that's where I think, you know, we talk about resilience and economy, right? That's where government should be focusing in terms of the education span uh, to create basically this kind of talents and this kind of skill sets for the future. Um, I think that's usually important. I think if you really want the economy to take the next step into being a real you know, value creator, uh, you have to start thinking about talents which can create intangibles, right? uh, rather than the focus that Malaysia has had in the past, which is about you know, tangible assets and physical assets. You really got to move more into the intangibles, uh, which you know, we've honestly been a bit lacking uh, in the past. Thank you. Well, my comment is in terms of this definition of Malaysian talents. Because I think the old world uh, definition is that, you know, you must be born in Malaysia uh, and reside in Malaysia and whatnot. So, you know, one pet peeve of mine is always opening a newspaper and seeing something. A Malaysian born <laughs> who's now based, you know, and now is successful. To me, I think that that, that no longer holds true in, in our current world where digitalization just connects everybody. Uh, you know, in terms of transportation, it's no longer a barrier, uh, you know, from hopping from country to country. So we need to relook in terms of what's the definition of Malaysian talent. I think Malaysian talent should be somebody who contributes to Malaysia, irrespective of where you are, because nowadays in the gig economy, right, you can be in UK, but you can actually uh, still contribute to, to, to the Malaysian economy digitally, anytime, anywhere. So you don't need to be physically present in Malaysia to contribute here. So I think we need to look in terms of a very, uh, into our fundamentals of how do we encourage people to start contributing into the country without having to go and fulfill very set criteria which were set in the whole economy in, in that sense. I think if we, if we do that, we embrace the fact that you know, the war for talent is real. The war for talent is, is very, very uh, critical. And if we don't do something, we're going to lose out very, very soon. Thank you. That's it. I think we have to invest in, in you know, in an ecosystem that, you know, that will promote, uh, encourage our youngsters, you know, with high uh, tendencies towards technology. You know I mean, so um, at the organizational level, I think there's so much that we can, you know, we can provide. Uh, and we are all, uh, what I call it, um, governed by our own ACTA, etc. So, you know, just to answer the questions, yes, we... We continue to recruit, to hire young talents, young graduates, and provide them a good platform 
in terms of the financial industry, fund management industry, banking, etc. And hopefully that uh, you know this will continue. This effort will continue. This con constant supply of 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 good talent people in the industry, especially in the financial or fund fund management industry. Um, but again, you know what we are finding lacking is uh, uh, in terms of our investment or rather the the call it the skill set in. In, in data, big data, artificial intelligence, etc., which is something that uh, it has to be an uh, cross the board effort, you know, um, together with the you know the you know, higher learning institutions, uh, the corporate sectors to actually start looking, uh, investing in this uh, what I call it specific lines of uh, discipline uh, going forward. You know, actually, Tan Sri, uh, picking up from Tuan Sai's point, it's not so much about talent, it's about skill. Because in Malaysia, the job market is 80% of the job demand is for STEM skills. But unfortunately, that we looked in terms of recent data, 60% of our graduates is actually in the humanities. So I, th I think we really need to go and put serious money into reskilling and upskilling our talents, young, old, into the ones that the job, uh, the market actually demands for, you know. So, so we need to do it very, very urgently. Yeah. Indeed. Um, you mentioned uh, one profession, uh, data scientists uh, or uh, data analysts. Uh, I think there are two other uh, professions uh, which are needed, uh, or more will be needed in the uh, capital market uh, space. Uh, that's the chartered financial analyst uh, qualification and uh, chartered accountancy. Um, so I think I know the three of you, three, your three organizations, PMB, SC and Benagara, have been big promoters of the uh, CFA qualification. Um, I would like to encourage um, all of us uh, to do more because uh, there's great demand uh, and supply uh, is not there. So I think we need to encourage more of our young kids uh, to pursue uh, this very, very rewarding and very much needed um, uh, qualification or profession. And likewise, uh, we need more chartered accountants too, uh, I guess. Uh, probably a bit biased uh, on my side. <laughs> well, um, uh, another question that came in, um, uh, this is on ESG uh, from Mina. What sort of weightage um, or percentage do you put into evaluating your potential investors' ESG? Or is it just ticking the box? So for, for us, I think we look at ESG as one of the gateways of filters right now. So essentially, it's kind of like a bare minimum. You have to essentially clear the ESG. Uh, compliance on our side, and then we then look basically as to whether you're a suitable investment. So obviously, I think whether we then invest in you is uh, really subject to financials, investment prospects, and everything else, right? Uh, but the ESG is essentially a gateway to get into that. Uh, so from an EPF perspective, we are moving away from tick the box, which is do no evil, to actually do good, so which is much more active uh, uh, positioning. So more and more in terms of our investments, we look at investments which actually has positive ESG, and that actually adds to the, to the value of, of the investment in total. Um, uh, so, so for us, we've moved away from box ticking. So for example, uh, there was one of our investor companies which wanted to go and put money into one of the countries in Southeast Asia which was having very bad human rights practices. We put our foot down you know, in, in terms of like saying we will actively vote against this and raise issues about this if this investment does continue. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, the, the company actually listened to us. And it took a bit of convincing on why of our stand. And the long-term uh, outcome of it was I, I hope that we managed to go and convince them that, hey, you know what? Human rights uh, uh, breakages is not, uh, 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 it's not something that you can just sweep under the carpet. It is something very, very serious and something that we, 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 we will take action on. Thank you. So if it fails the ESG screening, then I think it will be difficult for the investment uh, com uh, committee to actually take this forward uh, for, for approval. So I think at Coop, uh, it is very important to pass the, the screening test, even though we don't put the weight, but it is a consideration that we believe uh, and we put uh, uh, strong, uh, what I call it, uh, consideration in terms of uh, whether or not to actually accept the investment proposal or not. I think that is the, the, what, what we practice in form. But it doesn't mean that if it fails that it cannot go further, but it, 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 you know, it just, the momentum is, 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 is much, much slower. Lah, that way. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the next question, 
uh, no names, uh, but um, asking more towards um, asset allocation. Um, uh, all of you pivoting more towards international markets to diversify your risk. Your risk. Um, Let me start it. Uh, I mean, we believe, as I said just now, we have to understand at Quap, we have to understand the, the, our, the nature of our liabilities. And 100% of our liabilities is actually in Ringgit Malaysia. So we remain committed in investing in, in, in the domestic market. Uh, anything that we go beyond the domestic market is purely for the benefit of diversification and also to actually adjust our risk return reward. And uh, currently, our exposure international is about less than 20%, you know, even though we have rooms to go further. Um, but we, we, you know, each year we invest in the capital market, it is around about three to uh, about three billion in terms of new money and then another five billion in terms of the reinvestment proceeds. You know? So in total, we invest in, in the capital market in Malaysia is about eight billion. You know? and, and, and at the moment for the past two years, I've seen that, you know, that any investment overseas uh, is being generated by our reinvestment proceeds out of our, our investment overseas, you know, that, that meaning that there is no new conversion at the moment. So, uh, yes, we do look into uh, international assets, uh, but as, uh, to, as a matter of fact, that you know, matching our you know, the, the, the investment with matching the, to our liabilities, we are very much focused in terms of domestic market uh, going forward. This is a real uh, challenge moving forward, not just for IPF, but I think for all of the funds here, including PNB, because the rate of our growth of our, all our funds is actually exponentially much higher. Um, and there's only so much that we can keep on investing into Malaysia because then it exposes us to concentration risks. So um, I know I got into trouble a few years ago for raising this from an EPF perspective, but I'm seeing more and more also that my sister organizations are, are also going to be facing this, this challenge. I think it's, uh, it's, the regulators have been accommodative and they've been uh, engaging us, but I think this is uh, a, a real good timing for us to get together as a group, you know, all of the funds, together with all the relevant uh, regulators, to come up with a long-term plan on how do we actually manage and balance between the needs of uh, domestic as well as global exposure. Because like for EPF, our SAA actually keeps on saying that we need to be overseas and we've never been able to quite achieve that amount. You know, we, we're always playing catch up. And as the years go by, that number is going to keep on going up. So it, it's high time for us to have this deep uh, discourse and discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just end very quickly on, on that point, which is basically that I think as a sort of fund, right, um, part of the job of a sort of fund is actually to diversify the sources of income for the country. Right? Uh, and that means basically if you think about it logically, right, uh, the sum of our fund should really be much more focused on non-domestic sources of income. Uh, otherwise, you're actually just you know, increasing your risk to a domestic shock. Right? Um, and successful sum of our funds globally uh, basically really are much more external looking um, than, than domestic. So Kazana's going down that journey as well, um, at least on our commercial fund side, which performs that role for the government and people of Malaysia. Right? We see it increasingly being very focused on global exposures. Um, and uh, especially in global industries or technologies, which you just can't get in Malaysia. Mm. Right? So if you talk about resilience and building resilience to the national budget, right, then you have to really take a view uh, that you must diversify away from domestic assets and domestic uh, uh, resources. It's separate from our strategic fund. Uh, so the, so the Kazana strategic fund focuses exclusively on domestic investment. That's great. I, I think because uh, in order to when you invest domestically, uh, it will create that um, economic multiplier. Uh, create more jobs and uh, business opportunities for the people. Um, well, we are almost one hour up. Uh, um, well, as they say, uh, time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, so they've already given me, given me the notice to uh, stop soon. Uh, but if I may give all of you one minute each uh, for your closing remarks, um, we can conclude after that. So we're going to reverse one side. Okay. Right. Uh... Second half of the year is, uh, you know, for the 2020 is going to be uh, basically a realization, you know, new norm, etc. Alhamdulillah, uh, so far up to the 30th June 2020, uh, as far as our uh, performance is concerned, then we are, uh, you know, we are meeting our objective. 
And hopefully, if the market goes beyond 1,600, we are back on track in terms of our performance. And we are already looking into 2021 and positioning ourselves uh, into 2021. In terms of our contributions to the capital market, um, as I said just now, um, we are investing between 3 to 6 billion uh, into the market, uh, 3, 3 billion from a new money that we got from the contributions. And uh, another uh, th four or five billion is from their investment proceeds. Lah. So again, we believe in the uh, you know in investing in Malaysia. I think the 2021 is going to be a good year, inshallah, and we hope that we can position ourselves uh, uh, to to benefit from that. Yes. Thank you, Tan Said. Thank you. Um, your original title was uh, business normal or abnormal. Business right? usual or uh, business unusual. usual or uh, unusual. Uh, I think my, 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 my last words on this is that the unusual is going to be the usual move, moving <laughs> forward. So if any companies, any management out there who thinks that, you know, let's go back to the good old days, you know, you're, 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 you're still sleeping. So from an EPF perspective, we will be looking into companies and sectors that uh, accepts this new reality, accepts the fact that um, um, uh, crisis is going to be a norm, so to say, uh, it, it's just in terms of the depth and the impact of the crisis that's going to be different. Uh, and therefore, building up in terms of resiliency, building up in terms of the infrastructure uh, to go and ensure that they have a long-term sustainability aspect. And that should actually incorporate a lot of the things that we have actually mentioned. And the type of company sectors and industries that actually accept that, that will be the type of, of investments that MPF would be very, very interested in. So if you are still, um, still in bed and sleeping and hoping for the past, we will give you a miss. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think for us, I think you know, the, the, the rest of the year really will be focused on um, working out you know, schemes of assistance for those industries which are really going to need it. Right? And we know for sure there are a number of uh, uh, industries which are in trouble. Um, but we also see opportunities um, at, during the depths of the crisis. So we actually put out um, a lot of money to good use, buying up. Um, uh, equities which were at decent valuation. Um, so I think there's always opportunities in crisis and one of those opportunities basically is also to look at fundamental business models of some of our companies um, and to make again like I said you know, sort of difficult but necessary decisions especially in these times of crisis right um, to actually change um, or to take a different stance right um, and focus really on short return. So that's I think that the challenge I think for a lot of the investors today right um, how do you actually push your investing companies uh, to make those difficult um, decisions and move on. Well, thank you uh, for those uh, insights. Um, for us at Bursa Malaysia, um, we are unique in the sense that um, we play three major roles uh, as the exchange that provides the infrastructure uh, for uh, trading settlement, um, uh, clearing settlement. Uh, we are also uh, the frontline regulator uh, to make sure that um, we um, are firm, fair uh, and consistent, but we try to do it in a friendly manner, uh, if you like. Uh, but we're also uh, a public listed company too, uh, where we also focus on enhancing our earnings. Um, so, I mean, from our conversations today, um, as much as we preach other organisations to perform better, uh, I think um, Dato Omar and the management team at Brusa will also have to see uh, how we can also improve the performance of uh, Brusa Malaysia as a PLC. Uh, and of course, uh, we have uh, some board members here too. Uh, that will provide their oversight and guidance um, for that uh, to achieve. Uh, so with that, um, again, thank you very much for uh, participating in this uh, very uh, healthy panel, I would say. Uh, thank you, and uh, we wish you all the best in uh, driving corporate Malaysia forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.